Let's look at an example free body diagram. First, let's draw an example diagram. Here we have a mass M1. It has a couple of forces acting on it. And we've also indicated our direction of motion as x1, with the zero point of x1 being this bar at the bottom. So as we pull with forces F2 and F3, that goes in the direction of X1, and force F1 is opposite to the direction of forces F2 and F3. So using the F equals MA, the traditional and probably by now very familiar Newtonian laws of translational motion, now we can actually write F1, F2, and F3 as forces on the left-hand side, and the mass times acceleration is the right-hand side. So again, we change the sign of F1 to indicate that it's traveling in the opposite direction that X1 indicates. We can also change, as you see here, the direction of F3. It's plus if F3 is pointing up, and then it's minus as F3 is pointing down. So as we change that direction, we change the sign of F3 on the right-hand side. Likewise, we can actually change the direction of X1 and indicate that our anticipated motion and direction is down. When we do this, we have to change the sign of the right-hand side again to indicate now that F2 is in the opposite direction of X1 double dot, but F1 and F3 are, are in the anticipated direction. So with this idea of how we can decompose different forces, let's do a decomposition of blocks. So now we're going to take several blocks and put them together. We'll start with a simple one, just a mass on a spring, direction of motion in this direction. So we're going to use the Newtonian laws of translational motion to say that we expect this mass to move in the opposite direction of the force, F1. So we indicate the force values, and we indicate the mass times acceleration. And again, we're abbreviating the acceleration as X1 double dot. So we can see in the expression, minus K1 X1 equals M X1 double dot. This indicates that we expect, if we pull with force F1, that that pulling will be in the opposite direction of X1 double dot and that's why we indicate that with a minus sign. So that was fairly easy, hopefully fairly straightforward. Let's make it a little bit more complicated. I'm going to put a second mass, M2, on top of M1, and the spring constant for the second spring is going to be K2. So with this in mind, we need to change a few things. First, we're going to change the direction, or first we need to identify what is the direction of motion for a mass M2. And in order to do that, we have to say that state x2 is going to be the initial location of m2. And as m2 moves up, x2 will be getting bigger. So with this new direction, we can now decompose the blocks. So we're going to add another force on top of m1, and we'll call this force f2. And we need to draw a second block, m2, with a force pulling down, f2. And x2's direction, again, is opposite of how f2 is being pulled. So now we can decompose the two forces and sums of forces. For the top block, F2 minus F1 is mass times acceleration. For the bottom block, minus F2 equals mass times acceleration. Now you need to go back, perhaps, and think about this in your head. What happens if we spread the spring K2? So I'm going to pull on M2. Well, the spring is going to prevent me from pulling that hard right? The, as I pull on M2, I'm going to get a force pulling back. So that's why we see F2 pulling downwards if I try to pull M2 upwards. But likewise, M1 is going to move upwards because the force F2, if we, as we see in the top block, F2 is going to be pulling M1 up if I make the distance between X2 and X1 get larger. So that's how we can actually now write the equations of motion from the constants of a spring. So for the force F2, I'm changing the force by how different x2 and x1 are. So again, forces that come from a spring are based on how the spring is stretched, so it's based on distance. So as the difference between x2 and x1 gets bigger, the force F2 is scaled by the value K2. And we can actually write this now in the equations of motion by saying minus K2 times the quantity x2 minus x1 equals m2 x2 double dot. So this is the specific values for how the different forces are acting on the mass M2. We can rewrite this, if you prefer, by taking away the minus sign from K2 and changing the order of the subtraction inside the parentheses. You don't have to do this. Sometimes people prefer to not have extra minus signs sitting around. Just be clear in what you write. Make sure that I can see your subscripts X1 and X2 so that I know which is which. So that's the sum of forces on M2. Let's look at M1 now. 
So this is slightly different from what it was before because, again, we're taking the difference between x2 and x1. So that's giving us the forces pulling upward. And then we have another force which is pulling downward. That's the, the force K1, or the force from the spring that's indicated by K1. So as X1 gets larger with respect to R, K1 is going to pull us down. But as the difference between X1 and X2 gets larger, then that spring is going to pull us up. And these give us now the two equations of motion. And I want to write these in a much more simple way. So let's clear out a little bit of clutter here. And now we can write these two expressions sort of side by side. Here's the first one, and here's the second one. So I've indicated, and we'll see this later in the course, that I've reordered the variables on the right-hand side so that I have x1 and x2 sort of off by themselves, and then the scalar values combined in the middle. So this will be very convenient when we do state-space modeling later on in the course. So this, again, gives us our equation of motion. So what are we going to do with it now? Well, we could actually do a little bit of rewriting to make this a slightly different and perhaps more appealing form. So now we see only state variables on the left-hand side and only quantities multiplied by those state variables on the right-hand side. But it's important to see, as the note points out, this will bounce forever. We don't have any attenuation in the system. So once we pull on it, once we set a difference between x2 and x1, we're going to start bouncing around. So how can we make that not happen? Well, we could use dampers. So this is not per, per se a controller design, but this is how you add things to a system to prevent them from just oscillating forever. So the damper is described in several other diagrams, and we have a couple of videos that talk about dampers. Uh, it's important to remember that the damper is not based on the distance of difference between x1 and r in this case. It's based on the velocity of x1. So we can decompose this into a block diagram with the various forces. So here we have the force F1, which we indicate is pulling down. And dampers are a resistive force. So as we try to make M1 move, it will move with a certain velocity. And the force is proportional to that velocity. So it's not proportional to the distance. It's proportional to the velocity. And as we sum these forces up, we indicate that minus F1 is equal to mass times acceleration. Why is it minus? Well, because F1 is drawn in the opposite direction of X1. So when we write this out, minus B1 X1 dot equals M1 X1 double dot. This is our equation of motion. If we add now a spring, K1, we need to add another force to our individual block diagram, and now this is going to change our equations of motion. So we need to add an F2 on the left-hand side, and again, this F2 is going to be pulling downward. But F2 is not based on velocity, it's based on a single value distance. So we have minus K1X1 minus B1X1 dot equals M1X1 double dot.